Okay. So, uh, before we get started with the girls today, what I wanted to go over is uh, the use of jumping exercises and training of volleyball athletes. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of the title I came up for this lecture, but and I know that's long and wordy, but the idea is that uh, in a lot of cases you see with, with training such as this, people say, okay, we're going to do plyometrics, or we're going to do plyos, or we're going to do this and that, and uh, I, I think that uh, I'd rather distinguish between plyometrics and jumping exercises, because there are a lot of ways that we use jumping exercises that, while they're uh, plyometric in terms of the, or they have a plyometric component in terms of the sort of Western traditional definition of plyometrics, they don't fit into the original like uh, intention or the uh, the Eastern kind of definition of shock training or where plyometrics came from. So I like to distinguish a little bit between the two and I'll kind of get further into uh, what I mean between the difference and how we use the different types of things. Uh, but uh, I think it's important in, in terms of when we have a discussion, when I say plyometrics, I mean this. And when I say jumping exercises, I mean this. So in terms of what we're going to talk about with this is the way that we're going to use all jumping in their program. Um, so again, we need to think about what role we play in the sort of um, preparation of these athletes, and that is that everything they do in here in the weight room is general physical preparation. Uh, none of us are qualified to coach any volleyball you know, on a technical or tactical level, so we're not going to do that, but uh, we can help prepare them physically for their sport. <coughs> Um, to start, we kind of need to do a needs analysis, and I'll just cover this real quickly, but uh, in, in, a, in a lot of cases we go more in depth on the needs analysis, but basically what this means is, um, you know, we need to uh, understand the demands of their sport, and then, you know, and that's what's going to kind of guide us for their training, um, and, and that we're going to prepare them physically for these demands that, that we've determined based on watching their sport, um, looking at time motion analysis of the sport, and, uh, and basically just all the bioenergetic and biomechanical demands that are placed upon them. Um, so, I, you know, that could be a whole nother lecture or uh, a whole nother, um, you know, seminar on its own, understanding needs analysis, uh, breaking those down, but uh, I, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, but you guys have seen volleyball before, obviously there's a lot of jumping in it, and so, uh, you know, jumping exercises are an important component of preparing them to do all this jumping that they're going to do in their sport. Um, I want to move on uh, at this point and talk about uh, how we use jumping exercises in as a uh, as an injury prevention mechanism, uh, or an injury prevention, uh, I guess, method. Um, so the primary uh, injuries that I see uh, with the volleyball players that I've worked with um, come in one of uh, four kind of areas, ACL and other knee injuries, uh, you know, some other associated knee injuries, um, ankle injuries, typically sprains, um, Spine injuries, uh, you know, when you work with these kids, uh, especially uh, the girls, especially the tall, skinny ones, they end up having a lot of sore backs at first, which then a lot of times turn into uh, either spondylolisthesis or a spondylolysis. Uh, either way, we see a, a fair number of spine injuries in volleyball players. Um, the fourth one would be uh, shoulder injuries, but we're going to kind of stay away from that since uh, I think that the jumping exercises don't play a large role in injury prevention of the shoulder. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of, of shoulder girdle mechanics and uh, glenohumeral mechanics that, that are, are poor for volleyball players that, uh, you know, uh, that cause them to have lots of shoulder problems. Um, but that's, you know, same for another day. Um, so, uh, Within these, I'm going to try and cover them as fast as I can uh, and still make sense. Um, with ACL injuries, 
there is basically, you know, I ascribe to this four-factor approach for preventing ACL injuries. Number one, uh, teach them good movement biomechanics, specifically to stay out of valgus. So knee valgus is this knock-knee position you see athletes, uh, especially females, exhibiting during landing and jumping and cutting mechanics that cause them to go on and have an ACL injury, um, or that are at least part of the mechanism of the injury. Um, <clears throat> So uh, by giving them a progressive feedback intensive uh, jumping exercise program, you can alter their biomechanics. Uh, and it's been demonstrated in the research and I personally have had a lot of experience with that and, and some pretty good experiences fixing uh, biomechanical flaws as related to knee valgus. Um, number two, uh, getting them to activate their posterior chain and getting their posterior chain stronger. So what we see in female athletes that, in terms of injury risk is that they have a, a greater amount of uh, quad dominance than males do. So their hamstrings are either weak or not working correctly. And uh, I, I think that their glutes and low back go into this equation as well. But the research mainly focuses on hamstrings. But uh, I, I think it really is a function of the entire posterior chain. But basically, they're weak down the whole backside. So uh, this is probably, um, of the four factors, the one that has the least to do with the jumping exercises. But uh, and you'll notice when we do a lot of these jumping things, I'll have the athletes land and go into a deep hold position where their foot is flat on the ground, their chest is up, their shoulders back. And in that position, uh, you know, where their thigh is parallel to the ground, sort of like the bottom position of a squat, you have uh, a good amount of hamstring recruitment. So you're teaching them to turn on their hamstrings as well as strengthening their hamstrings. Um, this is really is an issue that we address more on the strength side and when we're you know, going through a lot of the, uh, the uh, weight training exercises. But uh, it's, it, there is a component of it in the jumping. Um, number three is uh, a side-to-side -side deficit. So, what we see in female athletes is that they typically have a side-to-side uh, -side discrepancy that is greater than male athletes. Um, and this increases their risk for ACL injury. Um, there's a lot of research behind it, which I won't get into uh, because of time. But uh, basically, one thing we seek to do is eliminate the side-to-side -side discrepancy. Um, and again, the, the feedback-heavy progressive jumping program uh, is what does that. So, and what I mean, what I mean by feedback heavy is you have to constantly be talking to the athletes. So, as they're going through these exercises, you need to be constantly reminding them to, uh, you know, land softer, keep their knees apart, sit back as they land, keep their chest up, um, you know, all these different cues, and we can come up with a thousand different cues here that work or, or you know, to some degree, but basically, you're constantly barking these cues at them. Um, and uh, then the second part of this is progressive. So there needs to be an element of progression or else what you see is they master the, the technique that you're having them do and then there's nothing to pick apart. So the moment that your feedback stops and you say, oh, well, you know, you did that perfectly, that's when you need to make a change right there. So you need to have the athlete doing something that they're safe doing, but that they still need feedback to correct. And, you know, you can let them have some perfect attempts and still keep them at that level, but as soon as they're consistently doing whatever jumping exercise you have them doing with uh, perfect technique, then that's, you know, uh, that's a, a, a sort of cue for you that you need to progress the exercise. Um, with the progression, there are a lot of things that you can do. Um, you know, normally what we do is landing exercises first, so just landing from a low box. Then start to add in jumping. Then, uh, you know, add in lateral movements, rotatory movements. Double to, you know, go from two legs to one leg, double to single. Um, start adding in multiple jumps in a row. Start mixing lateral movements with rotatory movements. Um, start adding in a perturbation. So, you know, maybe you have them go through a series of jumps and then you throw a volleyball at them and have them move and either pass the ball or set it or whatever, but give them some stimulus so that they have to react. Um, 
And there's some other things, you know, you can, uh, sometimes it may be warranted to move to an unstable surface, although uh, I don't do that a whole lot. Um, but basically you have to make these things harder for them so that you're constantly giving them feedback, so that their mechanics are constantly improving. Um, <clears throat> and then the final one is trunk control. So uh, we think about the typical ACL injury mechanism, you know, you have tibial external rotation, femoral internal rotation, a knee drops to the inside, their center of mass is outside their base of support to the outside, and you have that valgus collapse. There are a few other things going on, but that's the, the, the main parts of it. Um, so one component that I mentioned there is that they flex their trunk to one side, and their center of mass goes lateral to their base of support. So when that happens, the valgus torque on the knee goes way up, and the ACL being the primary restraint there, uh, you know, it has a force threshold, it reaches that and it breaks, and then you're in big trouble. So one thing we do is work on trunk control. <clears throat> and that means uh, not only doing trunk strength exercises, which, you know, I, and a large number of people have asked me, are you going to, you know, do core strengthening? Uh, I'm not going to get into why I don't really like the word core. It's been overused by our industry and, and really to the point where it has little meaning now and trying to restore meaning is a value but uh, for our intents and purposes here we're going to kind of think about core strength and uh, how we're going to improve this function and keep athletes from moving their center of mass outside their base of support to the, to the side. Um, and you know what this means is that we're going to work on strength and we're going to work on control because those are two distinctly different aspects of, of this equation. Um, you can have somebody with a really strong core, uh, you know, or trunk musculature, or whatever you want to call it, but they're, they have an inability to control that in a dynamic situation. So when we're going through these jumping exercises, you see them, you know, still flexing to the side and not keeping them themselves uh, upright. Um, so again, this goes back to um, being strong, which I do see as a problem in a lot of these kids, especially our, our female volleyball players, because they, you know, you, they tend to have, well, as you'll see, you know, a lot of them are six feet and over, so they have long trunks and they're pretty skinny around. Um, so they just don't have the strength needed in there. But then also, uh, you know, they, this control is a problem. So, to fix the strength, uh, you know, we'll do a lot of things in the weight room, uh, and that's not, uh, you know, for this lecture, that's another thing. But uh, for the control, it goes back to that feedback, uh, feedback driven and intensive progressive uh, jumping program. So, again, you're giving them feedback, and that's one more piece of the puzzle to keep themselves centered over their basis support. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this is really important when we look at uh, the, the injuries, um, and this is mostly specific to ACL injuries, um, but uh, when we move to ankle injuries, uh, I think that, you know, a lot of these same principles carry over. Having good biomechanics, uh, keeping your, your knees and your ankles and hips in a line, uh, and, and using the same good biomechanics that are going to help you prevent ACL injuries, I think are, are relevant for ankle injuries. Uh, I think if people are healthy, uh, if these volleyball players come in healthy with no you know, ankle problems, which is not always the case, uh, I think that you don't have to do anything really special outside of, this, uh, outside of what we're already going to be doing. Um, and then, uh, so, I, you know, I, I don't think there's a whole lot more to be said in terms of preventing ankle injuries. Uh, you know, there is a lot of research out there about using unstable surfaces, and I think that, that could be warranted. But in my experience, you can challenge their balance and challenge their control without having to put them on uh, an unstable surface. Um, you know, if you use your creativity a little bit and you're doing some high-level single leg jumping stuff, and uh, you know, balance is, is pretty well challenged there, and I think you get the same benefits. Um, we talk about spine injuries, uh, and what I, what I see here is uh, an inability to dissipate forces. So these girls do an enormous amount of jumping anyways, 
and you know the the forces that they incur jumping up and down on the hardwood it gets to where it's just too much um, and this goes back to the inability to control their core mixed with the lack of strength there and uh, and their poor mechanics in their lower extremities uh, so they have these mechanics that cause them to have really high forces they land with straight legs and you know they really pound on the ground so part of what we do is teach them to land softer um, but I think that uh, yeah, and I'm not going to get into spinal biomechanics again it's not within the scope of this lecture but I think the important thing to understand is that when we look at ACL injuries, ankle injuries, spine injuries, all of these things, we see a lot of commonalities in the biomechanical patterns that are either good or bad. And, uh, and what you'll see is that even in high level players, like we're going to see today, uh, you see a lot of pretty poor biomechanics. And uh, I think that you, know, you can get a lot of changes pretty quick if you, you know, just go through the basics with them. And what I see a lot is that people want to get to the highest level of exercises really quickly. They think, oh, you know, my daughter is this great volleyball player. She should be doing, you know, she's a high level competitor in her club or high school or whatever. She should be doing the highest level of activities. Well, we see even at the top collegiate level, girls are tearing their ACLs, they're having spondies, you know, they're injuring their ankles, they're doing these things, and they have bad biomechanics. Go and look at an injury video from, you know, a college volleyball match, and you'll see the injury mechanics are the same as they are in middle school. So, uh, you know, I think at all levels, they need to understand their uh, basic biomechanics and really work on making those better. And then you only progress them as they perfect one technique. Um, and uh, let's see, my outline moves to movement perfection. Um, kind of covered that already. Uh, so the other thing about movement perfection is, and I guess what taking a step back from the injury mechan uh, mechanics um, and the injury prevention uh, stuff, movement perfection is one thing that we're looking to achieve with our jumping exercises. So. When we think about the difference between um, the Soviet definition and the uh, American definition, and again, I get to comparing uh, Russia versus America. This is a product of growing up in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> what we have is, uh, you know, the Soviets were instrumental in developing plyometrics, and they came up with this shock training, and, uh, the, you know, you can read all about that. And now we have this definition of plyometrics, which is being peddled at every, you know, speed training camp and all this other stuff. Um, and they're two very different things. Uh, so I tend to think of plyometrics as more towards the shock training, you know, doing depth jumps, doing uh, uh, bounding and, and hurdle jumps and things like that. Things where you're looking at, uh, at trying to develop that rate of force development and really have some pretty high forces and managing those high forces and, and having your athlete be able to create and attenuate those high forces. Whereas movement perfection is more what I would say most people are doing in terms of plyometric, although I think they're doing it poorly. But jumping, submaximal jumping exercises have a plyometric component in that they, uh, the, the part of the force development there is, um, uh, it, you know, it uses that stretch, that stretch shortening cycle, but they fall out of the mold of uh, the Soviet definition. I'm going to get a drink of water. Pause. I'll make this a two-part video. <laughs> Is that thing still recording? Uh, it records for half an hour. I don't think you can drive for half an hour. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to make it two parts. <laughs>